Hi, everybody. We're going to give it a minute for our participants to trickle in, and then we will um, get started with the Q&A. All right, um, I'll start with the introductions. Uh, welcome to the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference 2022. Thank you for coming to this Q&A with Jan Hawken about necessity part two. Uh, I, my name is Lisa Milstein. I am a conference co-director for PILC this year and I'm gonna be moderating this Q&A. But before we get started, I just have a couple of announcements. So first I wanna do a tech warning. Um, so don't worry if you can't see or hear yourself, this is a Zoom webinar, so uh, attendees have their videos and audio shut off, um, and you should only be able to see the me and Dan, the panelists, um, and throughout, but throughout the Q&A, if you have any questions, you can throw them into the Q&A function, and we will be reading them off throughout the, the Q&A. Um, additionally, if you'd like to donate to Friends of Land Air Water, the uh, student group alumni board, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, Friends of Land I Water helps to provide stipends to students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships over the summer. If you're interested in making that donation to help us provide the students with those stipends, the information is going to be on a link that we are also gonna put at the beginning of the Q&A momentarily. Uh, lastly, before getting started at the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Alehi traditional indigenous homelands, of, which is the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, the Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coastal reservation in, res, reservations in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Siletz Indians of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde community. Um, and they both they continue to make important contributions in their communities at the University of Oregon and across the land we now refer to as the state of Oregon. Pilk would like to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya peoples in the Willamette Valley and express our respect for the tribal nations of Oregon. Uh, we will now move on to the actual Q&A. Um, so for anyone who may not be aware, Jan Hawken is the director of Necessities, uh, the films Necessity Part 1 and 2. Uh, PILC attendees had the opportunity to stream Necessity Part 2 throughout the weekend um, as part of our brochure, which is actually still available uh, all the way until tonight. So if you haven't had the chance to watch it all the way through, we'd like to see it again you can watch it um, until tonight. Um, so uh, just a quick description for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Necessity Part 2 is continuing the story in Necessity Part 1 of the indigenous-led fight to stop Line 3 in Minnesota and activists of uh, use of the necessity defense. Part two is set in the Columbia River Gorge here in Oregon and follows activists in Portland as they uh, also enlist the necessity defense in a jury trial. This film on climate resistance in the Pacific Northwest brings into view a historical landscape of tribal leaders, indigenous activists, 
and white allies as they resist oil trains, terminals, and trucks carrying the lethal products to market. Um, Jan, do you have anything to add before we start getting onto the questions? The only, uh, the only thing I would add, and thank you so much for that introduction, is that the subtitle of part one is Oil, Water, and Climate Resistance. Uh, the second film is called Necessity, uh, Climate Justice, and the Thin Green Line. So we can talk more about the, the difference between the two films in this series. But thank you for that introduction. Yeah, of course. Um, so starting with our first question, Jan, I know that before getting into film filmmaking, you uh, have been a professor at Portland State University in psychology for a long time. How did you start, how did you move from uh, being a professor into filmmaking? Well, I've, I've always been a, a social justice activist as well as an academic and a, a field researcher. And so my work for 35, 40 years has focused on social problems, social dilemmas that uh, generate anxiety and conflict. So I think of psychology as a way of framing issues that helps people to hold a problem in mind long enough to um, respond thoughtfully to it. So many of the um, many of my topics have been around very um, emotionally charged and um, um, contentious social issues, including the climate crisis. Um, I worked for many years uh, using the film as a, a, a tool for gathering data in uh, field settings. Start starting in West Africa, taking cameras there to get women's stories as they were fleeing the um, Sierra Leonean civil war and wanting to bring a fuller picture of how humans communicate about the, the dilemmas that are the focus of field researchers. And I think you've seen many um, wonderful presentations today or over the last uh, three days of scholars who are generating Incredible findings in research and um, kind of under often heroic conditions, continuing their research. And I too have, have been passionate about field research, but saw the medium of, doc, of the documentary as a way of bringing findings of public interest into a medium that is, in some ways, very democratic. I mean, let me tell you, everyone has an opinion about films and everyone's a film critic versus for decades I would present at conferences and around also also controversial topics and some brave soul at the back of the room might raise their hand with a question but in general people were you know intimidated by charts and graphs and um, less uh, apt to connect with the findings in a personal way so as a psychologist I also became interested in how do you bring research findings and a history of scholarship into areas of public concern. So I thought of myself as a kind of public intellectual as well as activist scholar uh, using this medium, not only to bring a picture of a problem into view in a way that people could kind of take hold of it, but also the, the method itself grew out of my participatory research methods where Participants and communities involved in the film are also generating questions as we go. Lead subjects have see work samples um, and are able to respond to um, whether that um, how my use of this their story really um, reflects what they really think because you have generate a lot of footage and you select a small part of it to include in a film and whereas an individual may be a data point on a graph. <laughs> you don't have to get their permission for where they are in that aggregate data. When you're generating stories and pictures of people's lives, hear their voices and see them, there's a feeling of intimacy to it that, um, that brings special ethical obligations to the researcher and the filmmaker. So that itself is the method itself, the participatory method, 
is something I've written about and spoken about quite a bit, particularly as you gather up the stories of marginalized communities to tell a collective tale of struggle. So there's, um, I'd be happy to respond to other questions about that as well. Um, so switching gears just a little bit, we have a specific question from Claire that says, in the beginning of the film, an indigenous woman was arrested for her protest, but they were talking about how it was on the tribe's ceded territory. I was a little confused on about what she was arrested for. Was it also for trespass? If so, how was an indigenous person arrested for trespass inside their own ceded territory? Maybe this is an Indian law issue that I'm not fully aware of. Well, I, I think you've really um, touched on an issue I became really sensitized to in the course of both of these film projects, how boundaries are defined through the history of treaties in this country and the importance of treaties that are both a history of shame and oppression of violence against indigenous people, but also are a powerful tool for fighting industries that are basically killing us all. And I think people are often aware, um, non-Indigenous people, of reservations and that treaties involve the forced uh, ceding of land that is relinquishing land to uh, the US government and, and state states, primarily the US government. And these the treaties are built into the US Constitution. Lesser known and what we wanted to bring into view with this different ways of mapping um, tribal territories is usual land of usual and custom uses. That the, the signers, even under duress of treaties in the 19th century reserved or, or did not cede the right to have access to clean water. Uh, in this area, salmon and, and access to waters has been very vital in a front of fighting the oil trains and oil companies as well as other industrial interests. So she was, she was standing on ceded land, but that also involved treaty claims in terms of preserving the health of those lands to be able to engage in the fishing rights in gathering and other um, material and spiritual activities that involve the, um, the access to, to uh, healthy lands and waterways. So she was arrested because she wouldn't get out of the road when the police um, insisted. She laid down her body, literally, they were, they were driving a megalode, this massive uh, truck and machineries up to the tar sands. Um, and she, laid down on top of the treaty uh, map um, and then was hauled away by the police. And that's of course, one of many ways people are arrested and intend to be arrested um, to make a point about the, you know, who are the, who are the real criminals and invaders here. Thank you for, for such an insightful answer. We have another question from um, an attendee that says, what was the most surprising thing you learned when directing the films? Um, well, I think part of what was surprising were the importance of treaties. And if, if there is any way lawyers, oh, I mean, many of you are, of course, very involved in environmental law and may identify as movement lawyers, which drew me into this project, you know, uh, knowing movement lawyers who defend activists engaged in social justice. Um, I, had, I had not been aware of how important the history of treaties are to this country and to the problems of the present, not just the injustices of the past. I remember one of the, when our first visit, um, when we went to Minnesota to follow the trial, we went to a, a Bemidji College um, Native American Center and they had a big banner uh, celebrating Treaty Day. <laughs> Thought, what is there to celebrate in Treaty Day? And then I learned it's a two-edged sword. Treaties are both the instrument of violence against in indigenous people uh, that continues today and is a, 
tragic history, but it's also an instrument of fighting back. So that has been, um, I guess, the most um, instructive. And the other is the, um, you know, I've, I've published a lot and uh, uh, done a lot of research on trauma and uh, just published a book a year and a half ago about ways of thinking about PTSD. And I think the, the way we think about a traumatized people and people who have been so harmed through the history of violence against them, destruction of their, their communities, the basis of their lives and being also has this other side of people who've learned how to live with tremendous adversity and, and um, creative ways of fighting back, partly through storytelling, partly through um, civil disobedience. And initially when we started this project, some white activists said, well, this is a really a, a form of privilege, engaging in civil disobedience, getting arrested. Um, and of course the, just the criminal justice system is very racist at heart and, um, and bound to social class privilege, but native people were getting arrested a lot and have been in recent years. So what they've learned from those, um, that history of civil disobedience that um, is part of sustaining your, your spirit through a long struggle one that doesn't conclude quickly, um, how, how do sustain your spirits and, um, and not be defined just as damaged or traumatized, but as you know, creatively still engaging in life and the appreciation and gratitude for the, the life that we still have, as well as that which has been destroyed. Thank you. Um, how has your psych, your background in psychology been brought into the, this film based on the climate crisis? Well, as, as we all know, this is a very depressing topic <laughs> and you don't need to be a psychologist to, uh, to have a psychologist tell you that people push out of mind things that are upsetting, make them defensive, uh, feel guilty or anxious, and either you want to push them, kill the messenger, or distance yourself from the messenger. So I, it was really important to me and the team to create films that people would want to watch, and that would not only document the bad news and the horror of what we confront, but would also um, help people to hold on to um, parts of history and human connections in ways that give us realistic hope, not just uplift uh, for its own sake. Or, uh, you know, often in, in filmmaking, there's a, um, a heroic individual who's first tested, you know, it's the classic heroic narrative where the hero is challenged and then has to meet that challenge confront their vulnerabilities and then triumphs in the end and often it's a male hero it's the classic uh, western hero narrative and i've always been interested in groups as a psychologist what is it that helps groups hold together and do hard things and there are a lot of war stories about that but most of them are male dominated stories and often rely on an individual hero narrative so um, as a psychologist, I've been interested in that tension between the disturbing and anxiety provoking of a picture you're presenting and also helping people to find ways of holding, holding something in mind uh, around human connection um, not, and, and teaching people to be critical false solutions where the hero, whether it's Joe Biden or whoever is going to save us from this dilemma. How, how do we avoid false solutions and um, find our collective strength? So each of these films, like my previous ones, involves kind of the, the dynamics of groups coming together, recognizing their differences, including differences in their 
um, there's there are um, histories of oppression, um, but um, being able to come together around a common cause. And so each one I think of as a form of social remembering or cultural remembering, where we're kind of bringing in our connection with people, many of whom have preceded us, but are living elsewhere. Um, and in a sense, joining arms around common threats to our survival. So as a, as a person with a background in psychology, do you have, um, I guess, any insight into how, how to deal, and, and somebody who's dealt a lot with the climate crisis, how to deal with things like um, climate anxiety and uh, a, a feeling of helplessness when the crisis is so big? Well, there's, there are many um, psychologists psychologists addressing this now in a way that I, I feel is really problematic, frankly. I mean, I've been part of a number of webinars and conferences, including one coming up in this month where, um, you know, there's a focus on eco-anxiety, clinical manifestations of kids, you know, having um, panic attacks. Um, I, and I think one of the problems with psychological interventions is that they focus too much on interpsychic or individual uh, coping mechanisms, which of course we all have to cope in life and find ways of dealing with our anxieties and, and getting up every morning doing what we have to do. Like people around the world, even in war zones, you know, people get up, they fix breakfast, they have sex, they, you know, kids play. And that's important to recognize how, how people find joy on a daily basis. But I feel like the, the psychological issues are how we come together to fight industries that it's not about whether you recycle as important as it is. It's not about whether you throw away the plastic bag or not. All of these things are important, whether you buy an electric car. Uh, the kind of capitalism we live under is extremely aggressive and produces these products for a reason. And I, I don't think we can sustain the economic system we live under for that much longer. So I'm, I feel like our individual outrage and anxieties needs to be directed toward fighting the, the, the corporate interests behind this, um, these lethal industries. And that people who become involved with others actually have, there's quite a line of research that, um, that argues that people are less depressed and less anxious when they come together. Paradoxically, people, activists who are involved in this issue are, I think, less um, thrown by like the return of the repressed in the news, where it is, I mean, in a way it is shocking, the scale of these horrors. Um, but if you have to deal with it and incorporate it into your life as someone involved in a movement, you're going to be less taken um, from behind on it. I think find a way to integrate it into your life space and also into your love and appreciation and sense of gratitude for life. So a question kind of on the, the role of filmmaking and organizing, um, do you intend to keep films in the, uh, keep making films like this in the future? Do you expect a necessity part three or will you have to, would you like to move to other mediums of public education? And what are the pros and cons of filmmaking as a tool for public education? Well, the, each, of, each of the necessity films is both about the necessity of, of civil disobedience, direct action, and other forms of um, activism that directly confront these industries, but also include many tactics, multiple tactics are featured. Um, but it, the first film grew out of the necessity defense. And I, I, I remember, uh, I think it's in early 2000, 
18, I had a fundraise. I was asked of a fundraiser for two of the um, valve turners who I'm sure most of you know about, shut up the valves. It was a four state coordinated action um, to shut off valves coming in to the tar sands in the US, um, tar sands oil. And at this, and there were a lot of progressive people at this event, leftists, and people did not really know what the necessity defense was. It was still kind of confusing from the talk that was given. Um, and so I became very interested in, and have for a long time done, and have done some previous films on the law and social justice. So I thought this is interesting. Um, what does this um, mean as a strategy, as an activist strategy? And what is its history? And so I thought a film would be a good way of drawing this out more and kind of public education that also would, as, and as it turns out, really was a way of bringing the trial that was shut down in Minnesota, um, it, it closed before the defendants had a chance to present their full arguments. Um, I thought, well, this is a way to show what they were trying to do at a trial. So it extends the stage of the trial itself. And so people can, the audience itself is part of the jury in a way, um, an extension of the jury and seeing how, why these activists did what they did, their reasoning, the level of, of planning involved. People often have a misconception of civil disobedience and its role in social movements. There's probably no, um, no social movement that we value that hasn't had this as part of its history, whether it's women's rights, gay rights, civil rights movement, all of these movements for social justice have involved civil disobedience. And yet many of my own students who saw early um, rough cuts of the first necessity uh, film were, had, were uncomfortable with civil disobedience. And part of it is the demonizing of acts of civil disobedience, showing um, activists as like creating mayhem on the streets in Portland, of course. So a lot of, of this uh, casting and some of it deservedly of, of people engaging in forms of property violence as, um, as, as though they're terrorists. So there's this problematic side of that history, but there's a proud side of history that involves tremendous trust, organizing, thinking through strategy that I feel like is still a really important story to be told. So when we finish the first one, it's, you know, it's, there's no satisfying day nom denouement as there isn't of course to any of this it's an ongoing struggle so um, we got some support from the doc society climate story lab in new york city to to continue with um, a series and and then to show how these same this necessity defense is being used here and so this film too as you know if you've seen it it focuses on a trial issues around the trial, but woven into that trial is the role of tribal leadership um, and indigenous storytelling and um, experience in fighting fossil fuels. Now, I, I am interested in another film primarily right now. I haven't said this publicly, but I'll say it your, your small group. I'm really interested in the promotion of small modular nuclear reactors, the so-called renaissance of the nuclear industry. And this is a good uh, example of how we need to use film and media more effectively in the left or social justice movements. If you look up small modular nuclear reactors and look and search for films and videos, 95% of what you're gonna see are very slick promotional videos and documentaries, some of which fe feature environmentalists promoting nuclear power now um, in responding to the climate crisis. On the other side, on our side, you see webinars with these very smart physicists and scientists who are not people you're gonna watch unless you're very motivated to, um, 
to dig into this issue that the the cri critiques of new, of this new form or this so-called renaissance of nuclear power the visual culture has been completely dominated by the nuclear industry and its advocates if you don't believe me just do a search so this has outraged me <laughs> and so i'm i'm looking into um, a way of perhaps doing a project on that i i love do uh, bringing scholarship and activism into this medium, focusing on what we can learn from the history of groups coming together, um, and the joy as well as the the heartache in these struggles. Um, so, circling back to what we were talking about a couple of minutes ago, an attendee asked, um, "How do we best help people come together in a world that is increasingly fraught with pandemics, wars, as well as the climate crisis?" Well, I think on the one hand, there is a history of people withdrawing and isolating and respond to crises. But I've, I've also followed for, I don't know, 35, 40 years now, the history of how groups respond to crisis situations. And we're seeing some of that, of course, in Ukraine. Um, we saw uh, much of this in the pandemic where People, unlike in the movies where you have anarchy and people killing each other for grabbing a loaf of bread, much of the history of collective responses to crises um, is actually quite positive. People do, if they are confronted with a, a serious situation and there are things that need to be done, people will come together more often than not quite effectively. So we have, I think a lot of, of history as humans to draw on that people can often uh, make enormous sacrifices if they do understand what's at stake. And so I think we've also seen, second point I would make, in addition to human nature is not inevitably selfish, evil and destructive, we have collective and altruistic uh, impulses and traditions to draw on. Second, the world, things can change quite quickly. And that, that what we've seen during the pandemic, what we've seen during um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, during this whole situ horrible situation with Russia invading Ukraine is um, situations can shift and re, reconfigure politically. And um, I, I know the trajectory is, is, um, is very, very depressing and could make you feel like, what's the point in fighting all this, these forces that are gonna do us under, if not in 50 years and a century. But um, we can turn the course of history quite quickly as a young, as a student in the 60s, I remember, um, campuses all of a sudden mobilizing, people becoming radicalized and politicized in the late 60s very quickly in a way that shook things up. And I do think that young people, uh, that the hope for the future depends on generate, uh, uh, young people organizing in a pretty radical way over the next decade. And I'll be there, have your backs <laughs> with my camera and crew and however else I can support you. Um, on a similar note, how do you deal with the destruction of property and conflict with, with the, during conflicts with the police? Are these things that become, do these things become scenes in your films and um, are, can they be teaching opportunities as well? Well, there, there are a couple parts to, uh, to your question. I think one is how, how do we view acts of um, what, what's, what's considered violence and even the whole category of violence is, is contested. Um, there was a movement decades back uh, that I was part of that looked at woman battering and uh, used um, wife beating talked about as domestic violence and women battering and, and extended even the notion of violence to emotional violence. 
Um, the difference between property violence and physical violence has been very important in social movements. Um, but I think um, there is also, when you engage in unauthorized forms of violence, um, where the state has uh, been granted the use of violence through the military, and that's an important part of our discussion of violence. Who has the right to what, to what kind of violence? And the military and the state reserve for itself the right to kill massive numbers of people and despoil and, and um, contaminate their lands. So when people rise up, it's more apt to be framed as violence. So I think that's really important for legal, um, for activist lawyers to challenge like what, what kind of violence are we talking about here? Who defines violence? Um, but the second part of your question I think is about would I, how do I film civil disobedience? I am always very careful in all of my films to, um, I don't do a expose or gotcha kind of filmmaking. The people in the films um, are who I follow are people who expect to be followed. And I, I always have, the um, participants look at what I filmed to make sure they're okay with it legally and ethically. So those are issues that are very important. The ethics of filmmaking, you know, how you draw on activity and portray activities illegal from the law standpoint. And I'm very careful about that. And I've never had someone in the last 30 years say, oh, I didn't know you were gonna show that in a film because they've seen it and they um, approved it. Um, but I, I think the, the, you had another question about going forward the ed educational aspects of these projects. Can you, can you hone in on that one? Um, oh yeah, I was, uh, or I, I think what the attendee was, was uh, asking was, are these moments of property destruction and, and violence as they say, uh, are they opportunities for teaching? Oh yeah, that's, that is such an important question. I think um, the news coverage always in, interests me because of course me, new me, news media will, and this is of course very evident with Ukraine, it, it draws, it's drawn toward the most dramatic, physically, uh, visibly dramatic scenes. It's not just social media that, that promotes violence. The media is drawn to the drama of a moment. And I'm always interested in some of even the quotidian aspects of movement work, you know, how people plan it and put out their message and not just the dramatic moment of confronting the police. And I think there's a problem of focusing too much on the high drama moments because there's always work that precedes and follows those moments. And they can be very opportunistic. Um, so I think that's the role I think uh, that um, activist lawyers have and many of the panels this weekend of kind of explaining more, um, you know, what are your rights? The Civil Liberties Defense Center um, and Lord Regan, you know, they've done this incredible work in teaching people about their rights. That if you don't know your rights, you're more apt to back away, especially if you see police bludgeoning people in the streets, who wants to be there? So we have a lot of work to do in training people to, to prepare to go into a confrontational situation, whether they will be forced into it or not. There are a range of choices and it's important to know your rights. And the media, mainstream media is not gonna be teaching you much about that. A lot of it will scare you. Um, but so there's um, this, the necessity team has been very um, honored to partner with Civil Liberties Defense Center and the work there and showing what they do through their behind the scenes and their legal work. So we have an, another question from Claire that says, obviously a big motivation for these protesters to try to get arrested is to go to trial and set a precedent for successfully applying the necessity defense to these kinds of protests. 
When there was a mistrial in the case, the DA chose not to prosecute. If the city is in the support of the protesters and would have wanted them to be acquitted, why not re-prosecute since they were so close to getting enough votes for acquittal? Do you think the DA doesn't actually want to set such a precedent for fear of what unknown circumstances it might be applied to in the future? Well, the, these are um, kind of complicated issues in terms of how, how you judge uh, a su successful outcome in a jury trial or any other legal situation where you're using the criminal justice system for purposes of justice. You are entering into the judicial system to argue for something. And, and the, the um, history of civil disobedience has involved many cases where, I mean, the, the, the um, anti-war movement, many previous social movements have, have used civil disobedience where the defendants claim guilty and then they take either do a plea or, or take um, whatever the court gives them, including jail time or prison time. The necessity defense is different in that you're, you're claiming you are innocent by reason of necessity. And so I think that distinction is really important. And it's a higher bar to meet when you go into a jury trial, things are really stacked against you because you're saying, yes, I did this. And that, you don't have to argue that case. You concede that you did this, but you did it as a, an organ is lesser of two evils, but as a matter of necessity. Now it's really hard to, um, and there's a whole history of, of, of jury dynamics and how you went over a jury, but this was considered a success in that six out of the seven jurists um, voted not guilty, that they were innocent. And the, the final one was very hard to win over. Um, and I think that was important to um, declare it as a victory because there's, there's no like com complete victory in any of this. It's all in a way a, a strategy for keeping the moral weight of responsibility on the other side, for winning over the community, um, for shifting the, the balance, uh, the weight onto these industries. And, and I think it did have an impact on the city, putting pressure on the city to not renew the permits. I mean, this, this will continue there. Zenith is fighting it. But um, that was considered a victory. Now, if anyone wants to do a thesis on this <laughs> as a law student, you can dig in. And of course, anyone who's written, read or written briefs, they're like, you know, hundreds of footnotes and cases studied. So whether this was the best strategy um, is still probably open, but in general, legal scholars consider this a victory. Whether it's a precedent or not um, is, in, is also, I mean, the notion of press, precedent is a complicated issue because there are um, many conditions that establish whether a particular case ruling can be um, set a legal precedent and be cited in other cases. So that's another complicated area. For me, the, the big, one big difference between the first film and the, the first necessity trial in Minnesota and this in that film and this one in the second film was that in in Oregon, in Portland, Zenith is very much considered an outsider, kind of an interloper. Um, they don't provide many jobs. They've snuck around a, um, a, a, a licensing agreement um, that they've tried to grandfather in to use in ways that it wasn't meant for. Um, and so in a way, I think it's been more possible to rally the public against this horrible industry um, and to kind of cast them as an out outsider like Zenith uh, to Sora Savage in Vancouver. One of the problems in Minnesota with Enbridge is that Enbridge Corporation is much more embedded 
in in those communities as an employer and they've they've courted a lot more people um, in a very active campaign um, including paying the police who get a lot of overtime as you saw if you attended that session this morning so I think another chapter that'd be interesting to pursue if any of you want to help me with this how do you how do you use different legal strategies in fighting corporations that are much more embedded and have romanced the community much more effectively versus those that are perhaps not as hard to pose because they're seen as outsiders and interlopers. I, I find that a really interesting uh, and tricky problem. So it looks like we're running up against time, but if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you uh, one last question. Uh, referring back to what you were, were speaking about earlier about your future ambitions in film, I think uh, Charles asked, I am curious about your view on nuclear energy and other topics that have become somewhat taboo. My question is, how do we best use media to explain safe development in areas that have such negative connotations? Say it's so, Lisa, do you want to expand a bit on, on or have uh, a little, I'm wondering about the last part of the question. I want to get at what this attendee is really um, wanting me to address in terms of this, there's the safety issue, there's the certain taboos around topics. Um, I think with, with nuclear power, part of, so I'll just respond to the part of it I understand and then you can ask more. I mean, I was part of the uh, anti-nuclear movement in the 70s, not a, not a big activist, but followed it pretty closely in sympathy with it as a psychologist, somewhat involved um, with the fight against Trojan, the Trojan nuclear plant here. And, and activists were very effective and very savvy, both legislatively and through direct action to bringing that tower down, literally, that then gets shipped, the tower itself, to Hanford, where it's buried. And those, um, so the, I don't know, 30 to 50 of those um, caskets of radioactive waste are still on that site. I, I've seen with nuclear that it's more, it's just not an issue that grabs young people more than it being taboo. And that the safety issue is still an enormous problem. No one has figured out what to do with these radioactive waste. And they literally try to bury it, this industry, either by not talking about it or so, saying, well, there's just such a small amount or we can bury it. It's a big problem that is burdening um, future generations in life as far ahead as, in, uh, as anyone can imagine. And it's, it's a, a reckless thing. I think what I've seen is more um, how effectively the nuclear industry has mobilized the climate crisis to hitch its sails to that because people are so worried. So, um, so Charles yeah. expanded on his question just now and says, I was asking how can we use media to illustrate developments in areas where the public views uh, that the uh, that the public views in a negative light. Yeah. So, like activism. Um, yeah. I think I think part of what I mean part of what I look for in my films are people who are engaged in the direct work of the problem. So I did a film about abortion providers last, and it was about people on the front lines who do this work who provide abortions and feminist clinics and it's literally hands-on and so you see them actually performing abortions in the film um, but also how they think about what they're doing and, and you need thoughtful people in a film who you trust who who seem informed and thoughtful and so I'm always looking for uh, for interesting, um, we call them subjects or, you know, guides in the film, who you kind of, you, who you trust enough to carry you through something that's scary. And so there's a, 
psychological dimension of that, how we identify with characters in films. There's a whole literature on that, how people identify with characters that allows you to kind of go with them and trust them in a certain way, to go into an area that's, that's scary. Uh, so that's part of it. But also I think um, drawing on, and I, what I try to do as a filmmaker and also a, a, an academic is to draw on parts of our, our history and the, the past and the present that can help us um, develop good collective ego strength. <laughs> we, we can do things that are hard together um, because if people just feel frightened and afraid, you know, there, there's this tendency to withdraw. Um, I think it's also a, a very interesting time to come into adulthood and find your way as a young person. It's a bit like, you know, I grew up, you know, in the sixties and came into adulthood um, in the late sixties. And it was like, things are happening. It's scary. And at that time, there was a lot of fear of nuclear war, uh, nuclear weapons, as well as other, um, you know, the Vietnam War. So I, I think um, just seeing yourself as a historical actor and not just, an, you know, um, an individual find, wandering in the wilderness of the world, but that you're, you're coming into a, a time in history that, that's important and exciting as well. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, I do think we are going to have to wrap up. We're a couple of minutes over. Um, but if you could, if you have a quick answer to this, uh, one person was asking, Matt uh, says, how do we join your film crew? Oh. If you have a quick, <laughs> quick practical answer oh, before we wrap up. Okay. <laughs> well, um, you can email me, hawkenj at pdx.edu, H-A-A-K-E-N-J at pdx.edu. And I would love to hear from any of you who have comments on the film or the, um, or the work my team is doing. There is a group of uh, 10 or 11 of us that have carried this for quite a long time. Um, many of them are crew. So, um, and it, if I, I have interns that work on these projects, as well as people who uh, work uh, as paid staff, um, a few of those positions. So I'd love to hear from you. And you can check out the, please check out the website, necessitythemovie.com to see what we're doing. And if your school um, wants to order the film, there's a way to order it. It's not available just video on demand because once a film is just out there to watch for free, people are not going to watch it for community groups, um, which is now our, our main aim is to help support community activists through educational um, events and, and conferences such as this. But I'd love to hear from any of you um, who have comments or questions and who want to um, jump on our wagon. <laughs> I did send both the website and the um, and your email into the chat. Um, uh, unfortunately, we are over time. So I think we have to wrap up here. Um, but thank you so much for your time, Jan. And thank you to everyone. Thank you who... so much. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you. Before we get caught up, I just want to say thank you, Lisa, for reaching out to me a very long time ago and including the the film and the project and this fabulous conference. You do such important work. And I wish you all the best as um, aspiring and hopefully move, movement lawyers. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And um, just a reminder for anyone who hasn't seen it, the film is still available um, to, until tonight on the Polk brochure. So if you'd like to watch it or see another scene again, um, it is still available. And note that the past slide, the password was incorrect in the program. It's water is life explanation mark with only the first letter capitalized. Yes, thank you. Um, have a great rest of your Sunday. You too. Thanks so much. <laughs>